Hi there, so uh, this is lecture three of uh, David Dyde, my lectures on engineering alloys. <coughs> and in uh, this lecture, we're going to look at the uh, Sioux City air accident. Um, and on the uh, website, I'll put up a link to the air accident report um, for this air accident from uh, the US National Transportation Safety Board, uh, which I would recommend very strongly that you read. It's good to read one of these things once in your professional life, at least, just to see how they're done. How are they done? So when an air accident happens, um, you, uh, you first have a, an investigation that tries to establish the cause, and uh, the safety aim of that is to prevent future accidents by making recommendations of how, things to, how to do things differently in future. You know, do you have problems with lots of other planes? Uh, are there different things you should do differently in manufacture? What happened in this particular one that made this one, uh, made this particular accident happen? Um, and this is a, a difficult thing because the, uh, uh, the report is aimed at safety, but of course there is a parallel discussion that's going to go on about who's at fault, who's to blame, who uh, is going to be sued, who's going to pay out compensation. And there will subsequently be litigation associated with that. And the air accident report doesn't speak to that litigation per se. Uh, the facts of the case will be re uh, rehearsed when it comes to the litigation in court. Um, but, the, uh, the, but the problem is this comes first, and this is the official government agency version of the story. Um, and the other thing that's difficult here is you will sometimes hear uh, media people, uh, sometimes even airline people, um, say, oh, this investigation should go much quicker. The uh, investigators or the company should release information as they're developing it to keep people in the loop, to feed the rolling 24-hour news cycle. And actually, that's, that's wrong from a safety point of view, but very strongly everybody involved would say in actual safety investigations would say that's wrong. Um, and it's wrong because you, you, your ideas develop as you go through an investigation, you find some things and you find other things and you find further things. And it, there's actually a process of figuring out what's going on and everybody coming together to agree what's gone on and iron out the differences and figure it out and then communicate what's happened to the world rather than drip feeding information from different points of view and lobbing them in, um, you know, that process doesn't result in truth, it results in chaos and causes great upset to those who are hurting as well, potentially. So it's not helpful, actually, to get out in front of the story and start telling your version of the facts. That's not a good thing to do, and the hence air, uh, uh, engine manufacturers, aircraft manufacturers, don't go and do that. And hence, we have to be patient when there are accidents to wait the year or so for the report to come out. So, um, type box over. What is this? This is a, a case study. And um, why we, we, I'm doing case studies are, it's part of your professional development, really, is to think about um, what happens when things go wrong. How do we figure out what happened? How do real things fail? What are the issues there? Um, and somewhat to shake you up, actually, to say, look, there are th this is a serious business. If things go wrong, you know, you need to be accountable for that. Um, and in part, in terms of our design of alloys and our design with alloy systems, um, how engineering systems fail then affect how we d develop new alloys and certificate new alloys and how we design new alloys. And so, in some, to some extent, we learn from experience. We fight the last war, like the generals. We try and avoid that issue happening again. Um, and so we try and predict what future issues might be. But one of our big sources of figuring out the issues we need to fix is the incidents that arise. The other thing is for you is to make you think about how a failure investigation occurs and what the responsibilities of the people involved are and what sort of skills you need to have. And you realize you need quite a large number of skills. The other thing is, you know, you will in a few years be going out into industry and maybe um, running a factory floor as a, as a you know, twenty something, mid twenty something graduate, and if you let things go there that you shouldn't let go, some years later you may be in court defending those decisions, um, and that's a serious business. And I, I want to make you prepare you for that so that you take what you're doing seriously. Um, and the other thing is actually to say, usually if we have designed the safety system for a large engineered object properly, 
It won't fail because one thing went wrong. It will fail because a whole series of things go wrong. That is, it can only fail if a whole series of things go wrong because all of the other catches and checks and so on should uh, mean that you can't just have one failure. So usually s the, the safety system fails as a system. There's no one part of the system that's to blame. Um, and so having made the, the scary thing, there's also the, if we've designed our system right, then actually a lot of things have to go wrong for, for uh, something to fail. A um, little bit about assessment. Um, how am I going to assess those? I probably won't these days ask you it as, a, as an exam question on its own, but I could do. Um, and I'd ask you to discuss one of the cases. There are other cases we could discuss. I probably won't in this year, but in other years I've discussed that Manchester aircraft fire that was a, um, a combustor failure in a nickel super alloy um, and so on. Um, I'd probably make it part of a technical question, but I might have a whole one. We could ask about defect types, life and philosophy, defect, how defects arise, predicted crack growth rates, these sorts of things. I will, I will ask you if I do a, a defect, uh, a, a, safety, uh, a s case study question, I'll ask you about what the direct material failure was and what the fault sequence was, how that resulted in the accident. Um, I might ask you about the indirect causes. Um, I ask, might ask you about why the failure occurred and you know, who do you think was to blame. Um, and I might ask you to discuss how we might do things differently or how, what the learning outcomes were from the failure investigation that resulted in changes in the way we, we do business. So what happened? Um, in 1989, in July, there was a, a, an aircraft that was a, a DC-1010, it's a, a three-engine aircraft, had two engines on the wings and one in the tail, um, that crashed in Sioux City, Iowa. Um, it was a flight from Denver to Chicago, and uh, it, it over the flight track, it was partway through its flight, and uh, the uh, tail engine here suffered a failure. And that failure was to the fan disc of the engine, that is the disc that the fan blades at the front hang off of. That um, disc was uncontained and uncontainable, and the debris from that disc disabled the hydraulic actuation systems that you use to move all the flight control surfaces, the ailerons and the rudder and everything else, all three redundant systems. Um, the pilots only had the thrust on the remaining two engines uh, to use to uh, control the plane. And actually, you've got to do a bunch of things there. You've got to keep it in the air. You've got to have enough thrust. You've got, you can get a bit of yaw going. Um, and in so doing, you can affect turns, kind of, um, and if you drop the thrust, you can change your rate of ascent and descent. And uh, thereby, uh, the crew managed to crash land at an airport at uh, Sioux City, at the Sioux Gateway Airport. And uh, their crash landing, uh, around 100 and, uh, 111 of the 296 people on board, unfortunately, died. Um, so this is uh, a video of the crash. This is the aircraft coming in. You see it disappear behind the trees. It's got quite a high rate of ascent. It lands. You see it here. Then there's a fire that ignites. And here it's rolling down the runway. Uh, so it turns sideways and rolls down the runway and breaks up, um, which is uh, pretty horrific. Um, and uh, so the first thing to establish is what was the fault sequence? What happened? How, how did that get to there? Um, this was a, a United Airlines Flight 232. It was a DC-10. Uh, the plane was delivered in 1971, so it was 18 years old, uh, which isn't... Sorry, 89, 71, 18 years old. Um, it had an airframe life of 43,000 hours and 17,000 flight cycles. So it wasn't really a very old airframe, actually, um, in, in especially in terms of the day. Um, it was a flight from Denver, Colorado, sorry, to Philadelphia, not Chicago, to Philadelphia. Um, and about one hour into the flight, the tail out mounted engine failed with a bang, big bang. Um, and hydraulic was power was lost. They tried to restore it with backup systems, and they couldn't. Um, and they could correct the roll of the airplane using the wing engine power settings, um, and to some extent the rate of ascent and descent. And uh, they had uh, some time, they spent some time talking to the tower, talking to United Technical Support in San Francisco, trying to ask for a procedure to fly a plane with only engine power and no hydraulics, where no such procedure existed. Um, and uh, 
They elected to land at the nearest airport, which was Sioux Gateway Airport, because they're worried about the stability of their airframe. Um, there was a, another airport they could have used, um, which was uh, Des Moines, which has a h higher fire category. Uh, Sioux City wasn't rated for such a large aircraft, only for smaller aircraft like the 727 and 37. Um, but it had an Air National Guard um, group there, that is uh, National Guard, ex-Air Force guys or volunteer guys who would uh, were fly airplanes. Um, and they had, actually on that day, they were on site and they had just done a, an exercise. So they were on site and actually had a lot more fire cover than they were required to for the type of, air, uh, of airport that it was. Um, and the crew had great difficulty in controlling the speed, heading and airspeed simultaneously. Um, so this is their track. Um, the airplane was coming up here, was rolling out, uh, was in the middle of a turn, and the engine failed here. And they then slowly executed a roll around. Um, then they did a few practice turns um, and uh, came along and alighted on this runway. Um, and there's another turn there, which is more than recorded on radar, um, and came in to crash there. Uh, while they were doing that, they dumped all their remaining fuel down to uh, reserve levels, which minimizes the amount of combustible material you have on board. Um, and they landed on a, a disused runway um, that was uh, 6,000, 6,500 feet long, rather than the main runway, which was longer. Um, the tower had told them this was fine because there was just fields beyond if they needed it. Um, and because they had a control problem, they went for the runway they could align on um, rather than try and go around and get down on, on this one. And they landed about 4 p.m., um, left of the centre line on runway 22. And initially they contacted uh, the, with the right wing tip, the right engine nacelle, which tore off that engine which started the fire, dragged them along with the right main landing gear, skidded, rolled, and broke up and rolled down the runway. And debris was scattered along about a mile long track. Uh, the fire crew attended, they dumped all of their retardant, um, but they provided a lot of cover to, to allow many passengers to escape. Um, they actually made a movie about it, so they're escaping into a cornfield with quite high corn around them, because it wasn't a regular airport, really. Um, and uh, it was a Jeff Bridges movie about this, the experience of being a survivor. Um, and uh, they, they then had a reserve tender uh, arrive, but its supply hose it had a little um, stiffener in the hose that rotated and blocked the hose and then they had to change it out and that led to a gap in the application of foam which made it harder to control the fire but probably everybody who was going to survive was out of the plane by then. So it probably didn't change the outcome any. Um, this is the debris track so the contacted there, the engine tore off there, the right main landing gear there. Uh, this is where the, uh, the number two engine ended up. Um, this is uh, another bit of the, the, the engine um, and the tail. So that's where the tail ended up. Uh, this is uh, no, the other wing engine. Uh, and this is the main center fuselage. And the fuselage, the nose is here. The fuselage broke up into a number of segments. Um, so this is the, the horror picture. This is uh, the nose. The tears here, that's where the plane was broke up. So you've got your main wing box here. The wing box is the strongest part of the plane. Uh, that's the tail, and there's several pieces here. So this, this tail piece was one piece. This was another piece. The nose was another piece. And these pieces were, were basically shredded. Um, and the seat map is colored according to the outcome for the uh, people sitting in those seats. Um, so unoccupied seats are white. So there's a few of them there. Um, fatals are uh, grey, or serious is a black. Fatals with the, who died due to smoke inhalation, that is a failure to escape in time, uh, with a very severe fire on board, obviously. Uh, other crosses, uh, miners are grey. So most of the people sitting here survived. Um, the, the crew mostly survived, the, the cockpit crew. Um, there were a few uh, children who were in the laps of people uh, on the seats, um, and there was a lot of discussion in the media at the time about uh, how, how could you hold them in your lap and that people were very worried about that. Um, and that was somewhat problematic. Um, 
And where, where the fuselage tore apart, um, then that's when people tended to die. So that's pretty horrific. It's basically what happened there. Um, so the first question is, should the crew have been able to land this? So we're going to go through a number of questions that you might ask about the accident sequence. So, okay, something adverse happened to the aircraft, but it was intact on approaching the ground. Um, so should it have been landable? Um, and actually, this was a very experienced crew. Um, the captain and first officer both had over 30 years' experience with the airline. Um, they had uh, over 20,000 flying hours. Um, the captain had 13 years' experience in the DC-10, um, and 7,000 of his hours were in the DC-10. And as a second officer who was relatively new um, to the airline and uh, to the DC-10, um, but he still had quite a lot of flying experience, actually. There was, in addition, a Czech airman who was actually a trainer for the airline who was uh, flying uh, back in, uh, back at, who was moving around the country, who was taking a, a, a flight with that plane in order to get where he needed to be. And he came to help as well. Um, now, well actually, post 9 11, that's something that people don't like to do is let somebody else in the cockpit. But they did that then because um, they knew they had this guy on board. And, uh, and he helped, came and helped too. So they had a lot of experience there. And um, if you check things like air crash investigation, the stuff, TV shows, they have lots of color. They're not very informative technically, they have lots of color about what the experience was like for these people. Um, and uh, you know, it was tough, but you know, check him and after, f after a few minutes of talking it through with these guys, went, you're really, you're really in trouble. <laughs> they're like, yeah. Um, and. Uh, Afterwards, the NTSB did simulator tests with uh, DC-10 crews, um, and their conclusion was that it wasn't trainable to develop a procedure to allow people to land in these circumstances. Almost nobody managed to. Um, and something like one or two crews out of 100. You know. um, they landed at about a 1,500 foot a minute rate of descent and a 200 knots airspeed, which is far too high a sink rate and far too high an airspeed to, be, to call it a landing. It was more a crash into a runway, if we're honest. So the crew did a good job to put it on the runway at all in any kind of shape, if we're, if we're honest. Um, one question is, they, th with hindsight, the airframe was actually in, in quite good shape, and they could have spent more time thinking about where to crash. Um, uh, they could have gone to a bigger airport, they could have assess assessed the condition of the plane more, uh, they could have given the emergency crews more time to uh, prepare. Um, but it's very easy with hindsight to, to have these conversations. You know, the air, cr air crew, air traffic control guys, United Operations Center, were all trying to make decisions. Remember, this is pre-mobile phones and the internet, this is people on old-fashioned telephones, uh, on, on radio, trying to make decisions together, and um, they did what they could. And they landed on, on an airfield, which had more fire cover than they needed. Um, one question is then, could the fire crew have rescued more people? Um, and again, they used more retardant than they required to have. Um, it was a much bigger incident than they would have trained for. Um, that is a detail. You know, They'd never tested the tender resupply hose that failed in operation. And this is one of the problems with safety systems. You, you see this quite often, is that uh, when you have some of your backup safety systems fail because you've never used them in anger before, um, and therefore there's some, you know, obvious the glitch. And that's one of the problems. If you don't, if you have a, an emergency, you know, you'll never use it in your whole career safety system. Then will it work when you need it? And the problem is, you haven't used it, so you don't have the experience, and it's difficult. Um, but they did a good job. Um, and really, you don't want to be on, in a plane on the ground in pieces and burning. You want to be in a well-controlled, safe situation. So you have no criticism for these guys, really. They did a fantastic job. Um, and uh, the same is true, really, for any fire crew at an airport. If you, if you need the fire crew at an airport and your plane is burning, something has gone badly wrong. And anybody they do save is a bonus. Um, next question is, should the disk failure have been safe? So um, 
in the course of this, I've, over the years, I've talked to a number of participants in this investigation, including uh, Jim Williams, who was wrote the book on titanium and was a, a, a senior manager at GE at the time um, of the accident, not the time that this was produced. Um, and I've spoken to Alec Mitchell, who consulted to the investigation uh, about mounting practices, uh, and one or two others, actually. Uh, Rob Ritchie included at the University of California, who's helped with the um, uh, fractography. And one of Jim's comments is, you know, for reasons unknown to Douglas, they produced an aircraft where they had all of the hydraulics lines next to each other. So when the debris from the disc went through the tail, it severed the hydraulics lines in two places, which managed to take out all three redundant hydraulic systems. They all drained out. They didn't have any check valves to stop dr things draining out. You know, if they'd have had a couple of check valves here, the rest of the system could have carried on. If they hadn't had all three going through both sides, they could have lost them on one side and been okay on the other. Um, and the FAA airworthiness standards required to certify the plane had a, a line that said, the airplane must incorporate design features to minimize hazardous damage in the event of an uncontained, I've inserted the term uncontained, engine rotor failure. That's an engine disc failure. Um, so, and self-evidently, uh, the system that Douglas designed and that the FAA certified didn't do that job. Um, so, but... On the other hand, hindsight is a wonderful thing. Douglas thought that it would comply, that this wasn't going to be an incident, that they, the, the possibility they needed to be think about, and the FAA agreed with them. So um, hindsight is a wonderful thing. Uh, and this picture just shows where the tail-mounted engine is. That's where the fan disc is, and it's just above this horizontal stabiliser. So you have the, although the, the duct leading into it goes to the tail, uh, is quite long, the engine's actually mounted here at the back. So really, no. The answer to all those questions is no. There shouldn't have been a failure in the first place. And there's a review in the air accident report that uh, looks at um, what happens after a disc failure or an uncontained engine failure of a large, where well, there's a large component. And the review re reveals there's a whole loss to the airplane, not necessarily a loss of life, but a loss of the airplane, um, well, writing off of the airplane, about a quarter of the time after a disc failure. So we cannot tolerate disc failures. We are, n um, as a design standard, when we're designing jet engines, we do not want these things to fail ever. Um, and uh, nevertheless, every few years, worldwide, there's one. <laughs> every few, but it's pr a pretty rare event. Um, Rolls have them at about once every 20 years. GE have had a few more, um, but Rolls had a bad patch in the 70s. So you know, let's not throw stones. Um, GE aviation engines expected that the life for a defect-free disc was about 54,000 cycles. And so as we were talking about with spin testing, that was knocked down by a factor of three to about 18,000 cycles life in line with the FAA mandate practice. And the energy contained in a disc, something like, I don't know the numbers for this disc, 60 kilos at something like 10,000 RPM, probably slower for a fan actually, is so large that the fragments are uncontainable with any reasonable containment system. Um, so the answer to all of this is you're never allowed to fail and that this disc was within its expected life, was it below its expected life. And the alloy used for that disc was TIE 6.4, which accounts for the majority of world titanium production, very well established, very widely used. So a very well understood alloy. Now. If we look at the service history for this disc, this is a graph showing its hi service history. And it's a bit tricky because this disc wasn't originally in this engine. That is, and this, this is quite common, um, this is a GE CF6 is the name of the engine. Um, the engine had a serial number of 451243, and the engine had a total runtime of 42,000 hours. But this disc did not. This disc had, uh, was manufactured in 71, was originally put in uh, another engine and had and then swapped over into this one. And that happens, you know, two engines go in, uh, one engine goes in, gets uh, stripped apart, you know, gets rebuilt and sent out again. One of its components, or its mo one module is rebuilt, and that module ends up in another engine. And so actually over time, the material swaps around. Um, so this disc accumulated about 41,000 hours and about 15,500 cycles. And this shows the cycle since new against the calendar year. And 
what happened at each uh, uh, over that period of whatever it is, uh, 17 years. So it started out in 1972, accumulated of 500 or so cycles, uh, slowed down, stopped, went for a shop visit, um, then it accumulated another 1,000 or so cycles, then it went accumulated a shop visit at GE, uh, accumulated another stop, another stop, another stop, but probably the modules weren't broken apart here. Then it did another shop, shop visit where it was inspected, flu stop, flu stop, another shop visit, flu stop, flu stop, another shop visit, and so on. And did another shop visit here. So the accident was at 15,503 cycles since new, flight cycles, and its last inspection was at 14,743, so only 256 cycles before, only about probably 80 to 120 days. Okay, so it was, and it had been inspected a number of times, and it wasn't required to be inspected at all until 14,000 cycles, but it's just these were opportunistic inspections. Every time the engine was taken apart, it's mandated that while you've got it apart, have a look. Um, and that's inspecting it, looking for defects, seeing how it, how it went. Um, so this is just to orient you as to where we are in the engine. We're at the front of the engine. Here's the disc. There's the blades that go on the disc. We're, we're here in the engine. Uh, we've got a spinner cone on the front for error reasons. And this is what it looks like. You've got a, dry, a disc arm coming off of there. This is your main bore of the disc. That's the rim of the disc. This is connected to uh, the shaft. Um, there are some bearings back here and the fan blade goes, it goes here. Um, and you've got a, a big fat rim and a big fat bore. The rim's got to carry the mechanical connections of the blades. The bore's where the stresses are highest. Um, and it took a bit of effort, but they managed to reconstruct the disc. You know, some of the parts were in fields, having landed um, where the original accident was. Uh, one of the pieces was only found when the uh, farmers came to uh, cut the corn in, uh, at the, in the autumn, a couple of months later. Uh, they got most of the, fan bl most of the blades back, um, and that's a reconstruction of it. Um, it's an original photo. And you can see that the crack has grown from the bore here and then grown out, 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 out and into this blade slot here. Um, and there's been another crack, another crack. And typically you see that the um, discs, when they go, um, freezes to do with how it rings as it goes to the final failure, uh, break into three bits usually, um, and it's just the way it goes. A very typical sort of um, failure. And when you come back to the origin here, um, then you get a picture like this. And this is the best picture I, I have, I'm afraid. Um, but the fatigue striations could be counted um, from the fast fracture all the way back to an initiating defect, and by uh, looking at the fatigue striation spacer, you can integrate up your DADN curve and come up with an estimate of the number of flight cycles that that fatigue crack was growing. And the answer in this case was that the crack had been growing since the disc was new. It had almost the same number of cycles in low cycle fatigue as the disc had subjected, been subjected to, that is 15,000. Um, and there is a little cavity at the origin of the fatigue crack which therefore had, been exi had existed since new. Um, and the crack grew in terms of the striation spacing in a way expected from the DADN curve and in line with GE's fracture mechanics calculations. So the material was good, apart from this initiating defect. The material did exactly what it was expected to do. And in this region, uh, then secondary arm mass spectrometry was used to examine a, a discoloration on the surface which was found to be consistent with uh, the, the sorts of atoms you would expect in the sorts of proportions you would expect in the uh, fluid used for dipenetrant inspection. And uh, this corresponded, according to the fracture mechanics, to the crack length and the striation counting, to the crack length you would inspect, expect at that last inspection 250 cycles before failure. That is, all of the rest of the crack grew in the last 250 cycles. Uh, and then the final fast fracture. Um, and these are the, the lengths, so this little cavity labelled C um, was about one and a half millimetres in that dimension and a radial depth of about 0.4 millimetres. The discoloured area was 12 millimetres in that dimension and four and a half millimetres deep. And the fatigue zone in total was 14 millimetres deep and 30 millimetres long. So 
at the point of the last inspection, this was quite a substantial crack. Um, and, and the way uh, non-destructive inspection works is you, you put on a, a dye which will soak into, the, uh, into any cracks. Uh, you'll then wipe it all off. Um, you may or may not apply a developer then to pull it back out. And it, that then shines under ultraviolet light. So you shine an ultraviolet light round very carefully and look for dye that's coming out of cracks. Um, and uh, this and NDI should have a, uh, an inspection limit, something like three quarters of a millimetre or so. So this was uh, probably an easily, uh, should have been a detectable crack at new, and certainly was during all of the inspections. So just to go back here, it was inspected one, two, three, four, five, six times, plus on the in the factory when it was first made, and none of them caught the crack. Very embarrassing. Now, one question, therefore, for question five is, should periodic inspection have caught the crack? And one thing is, for the uh, United Airlines inspectors at the time, they were uh, doing this at, at quite often at night, when people's attention uh, is proven to be worse. Um, they were quite often working alone. Um, and one way to improve the integrity of inspection procedures is to require people to work in pairs. Um, they were paid per piece that they inspected. And the Victorians proved that if you had piecework, you had lower quality because people just wanted to get make their numbers and get paid. Um, and you might ask if that was appropriate for a critical job. Um, one thing is they, they hung the discs up on, on wire rope, and therefore the wire rope was in the bore, and so you had to keep rotating it a number of times in order to inspect all the locations. So it was a difficult location to inspect. And the other one was that the places where the inspectors often saw cracks was at the blade root. Because at the blade root, if it cracks, OK, it's annoying, you have to replace the disc. But if you release a blade, that's OK, because you can contain that. So blade root cracking is, relatively speaking, common and tolerated. And you inspect it, and you take it out of service, and then you replace the disc. But the inspection, that you, the crack you really want to catch is, of course, the one in the bore that will result in the disc failing that will be a real problem. Um, and so the focus probably when they're inspecting was looking for blade root cracking rather than for the critical one. And again, that's quite often a problem in, in safety terms is that people tend to look for the, the, the irritating maintenance problem that's well controlled and understood and happens relatively often. And the start and the, the culture of remembering what you're really doing it for, the really critical flaw, starts to be forgotten. Um, but that said, periodic inspection is known to be not completely reliable. It only has a 90 odd, 95, I don't know, you do your stats, um, chance of successfully finding a defect. We, you go and take 10 inspectors, you put some defects in, you ask them to find them, you do the stats. Um, but it's not going to be 100%. Um, but the point is, discs shouldn't enter service with a defect like this in them. Simply shouldn't be. So the next question is, yes, it would have been nice to find it by inspection, but why was the defect there in the first place? So the defect was uh, a rose, uh, the cavity, I should say, was surrounded by a region of hard material which was entirely alpha phase. There are two phases in um, titanium uh, metallurgy, really, Ti64 especially. Um, the alpha phase, which is the, the low temperature phase, which is hexagonal, and the beta phase, which is the high temperature phase, which is BCC. And in uh, an alpha beta titanium alloy like Ti64, there will be a few percent of beta phase, and it will be mostly be alpha. Um, and around this cavity, the material that was left behind was very enriched in alpha phase. There was no beta. Um, and the conclusion was, based on looking at sister disks where there were uh, found to be other defects, um, and based on that rim, was that the cavity was formed by a so-called hard alpha defect. That is, a region around a millimetre in diameter that was 100, an inclusion that was 100% alpha phase. Um, and uh, what the NTSB report suggests happened was that um, this is the, the outline of the forging. You machine that to what's called uh, the RMF shape, the rectilinear machine forging, um, 
or the sonic shape. And that doesn't include all these backwards features and so on. It's just a nice outline quite close to the final shape of the, of the disc. And you ultrasonically inspect that in a tank. Um, and that you can do very well. So this is the ideal shape to do ultrasonic inspection in. And you do that in order to find any defects in the material. And if you don't find any, because ultrasonic inspection goes through the whole everything, so it goes through all the material you want to inspect, then you say, OK, fine, I will accept this material. Then you do your final machining. Then you do any surface treatment, macro etching, shop peening. Um, and the shop peening tends to make it hard to ultrasonically inspect. And then you do your final non-destructive inspection with dipenetrant fluid just of the surface, acknowledging that that's not uh, the most reliable technique. And NTSB in their report suggests that uh, the defect here on this bore, um, that was uh, there. Of course, it's an inclusion that's almost the same. We'll come on to it in a minute. But it's an inclusion with almost the same as titanium. It has a very similar ultrasonic wave velocity. So you don't get an indication necessarily in ultrasonics. Um, and the suggestion is it was there, and it was harder, for reasons we'll come on to in a minute, and therefore when it was shot peened, it was knocked out by the shot peening. And of course, this um, then you only had uh, dipenetrant inspection to find it with, and that's why it wasn't found ultrasonically, is that it was knocked out after the ultrasonic inspection. So in order to think about how this defect it forms, we need to go back to how titanium is uh, produced, which we'll cover in more detail when we do the, uh, the titanium lectures, but I'll, I'll start it now. So titanium is made by reducing TiO2, um, and it's very difficult to reduce TiO2. So what we do um, is we chlorinate it with chlorine and make uh, and carbon. Uh, that gives us a bit of a thermodynamic boost to make titanium tetrachloride and CO2. And if you're worried about the CO2, um, then uh, we could do it without the carbon, but then we'd need more energy which we would have attained by burning coal in a power station at 40% efficiency. So it's more efficient to do it this way. Um, then we ta having taken our titanium tetrachloride, we reduce that by putting it in a reactor with flowing magnesium at about 850 degrees C, and that produces titanium and magnesium chloride. Then the magnesium chloride is the start, actually, of the magnesium production process, so we electrolyze that back to magnesium and chlorine, and send them back into the process. And we end up with a big spongy mass like this. This is a, a picture of mine. Um, and uh, we do a number of distillation and purification processes afterwards to get rid of the remnant chlorine and so on. But that's basically the idea. Um, so uh, here's our, our Kroll reactor. That's what it's called. It's called the Kroll process after the inventor. Um, and we put in uh, our input Coke TiO2 have a fluidized bed in here and take off a vapor of TI, uh, titanium tetrachloride, tickle. Um, then what we do is we put that in a charge where we reduce it um, and produce magnesium uh, and put in our magnesium chloride, uh, put in our magnesium, sorry, and we tap off the magnesium periodically during the run um, and distill them off, take them back into our magnesium process. So we have a whole load of stainless steel reactors that are elevated temperatures in very corrosive environments, which we have under a vacuum when we're doing vacuum distillation at elevated temperatures. And these are then water-cooled and everything else. So it's not a surprise that, especially in the old days, there were leaks in those vacuum systems and those water systems. And those leaks resulted in um, the introduction of oxygen into the system, um, particularly the magnesium process, uh, which resulted in uh, hard alpha oxygen, well, in oxygen-enriched inclusions in the titanium product. So uh, here's a picture of the microstructure of our TIE 6 4 in one of its typical conditions. This is called a bimodal condition. We have some primary alpha grains here, and then we have a last structure here of alternating lamellae of alpha and beta phase. The alpha phase is approximately a composition of TIE 7 AL weight percent, and the beta phase is something like TIE 20 B. Um, and oxygen, this is the titanium oxygen phase diagram, and you see here, as you add oxygen, the transformation temperature from alpha to beta goes up significantly, and the melting point goes up significantly. So as you add oxygen, you stabilize the alpha phase, which is why you get a rim 
of entirely alpha phase around the hard alpha inclusion and why the hard alpha inclusion itself doesn't melt. You've raised its melting point and it's very hard and brittle. Its oxygen is a wonderful solid solution strengthener. So it increases the hardness, it decreases the ductility. Hence, when you shot peen it, you put in plasticity and it not gets knocked out because it lacks ductility, it just breaks up. And typically, if you do find them by ultrasonic inspection, you find them because of the cracks around them, actually. Um, so this is what a hard alpha inclusion looks like. This is from Lutcher and Williams' book. Um, there's the hard alpha inclusion there. Um, there's the cracking around it. There it's white etched, that it, it's a, uh, elevated content of alpha phase. Um, and where these can come from, um, they can come from when you weld together, when you, you take your sponge, you break it up, you compact it, and you then weld those briquettes together to make your original electrode for VAR. And when you weld those, if you make some mistakes um, and you don't have enough argon cover, then you can get little bits of um, titanium that oxidize. Uh, you tend to have put the oxygen in, in the melting process because that's when you have the greatest solubility and affinity for oxygen. So it's associated, it's, um, associated with molten titanium. As I say, the primary one was the vacuum or water leaks in the magnesium process or the Kroll process, or potentially the VAR melter itself. Um, potentially, you can have problems if you don't clean the first melt properly after the first VAR melting. Um, and the other one is if you've got it hot when you've been machining and you're recycling chip into revert to remelt it, then that can be another source as well. So there are many possible ways in which you can get hard alpha inclusions. Um, so, in order to examine what happened in this case, the first thing you do is you go and find the, the, uh, service, the history of that particular disc and chase it back through the manufacturing process. And the uh, aircraft manufacturers and the air engine manufacturers have always been required to have very rigorous uh, material tracking such that 20 years later after, after manufacture, they can go back and find out exactly what happened to that disc where all the other discs are that were made out of other bits of that ingot so that you can pull those and find if you have a similar set of problems um, and uh, find out what went on. Um, unfortunately, in this case, GE had records with for two discs with this serial number. Um, and they went and chased down the other discs from the same forging. Um, and this was uh, apparently time at heat K8283. And three were found to have rejectable defects, two of which were alpha case, and one was due to overheating during forging. So, uh, including the accident disc, then four of the eight that were found, four of the seven that were inspected, including the accident disc, had problems. So there was something wrong with this heat of material. And there's a lot of confusion. If you read the accident report, there's a long discussion about whether this was a Timet heat K8283 or whether it was an RMI heat um, because Alcoa, the forger, had two, uh, had both RMI material and Timet material on that factory floor at that point in time. And RMI are called Remelt Industries. They were uh, a company that remelted titanium for non rotor -rota grade uses. Um, and so the implication, they don't really state it in the report. But the implication is that uh, RMI material that wasn't intended to be rotor grade was swapped on Ocoa's floor, forged and sent to GE to be flown. Um, and there are some hints of that in the paperwork tracking, um, but there are problems with the paperwork tracking, so it's not conclusive. And of course, the, the thing is, if you've got a, an eight ton bit of metal that you're open by forging and uh, it's at 1,000 degrees or 1,100 degrees, then any markings you have on the disc will be lost when you forge it. So uh, you have to keep track of your ingots by watching them. And there are people who are employed to watch the disc, watch the material as it goes through the manufacturing process and keep scribbling on the numbers, then they get destroyed, keep scribbling on the numbers, keep scribbling on the numbers, and try and keep track of the heats. But in this case, it may be that there's a problem. And uh, I've had a number of people from... Uh, uh, different participants in the investigation claim that that was probably the case in this instance, although that's not a conclusion that the NTSB came to. They allude to it, but it's not a conclusion that they came to. Um, the other difference with RMI is that they were argon melting and time out were vacuum melting at that time in, uh, in 1971. And in 1972, GE mandated double vacuum melting after the FAA changed what should be done, 
full rotary grade material. So this was one of the last discs that were melted under argon, possibly, rather than vacuum. And argon would be less effective at dissolving uh, the hard alpha defects, would be less effective at boiling off the oxygen, which is why it was mandated to switch to vacuum melting. So uh, what happened? Uh, 1972, sorry, um, we moved to double vacuum melting rather than argon melting. Then progressively moved to triple melting, um, and the progress in the 70s was believed and 80s was believed to give something like a 10 times reduction. That's what people say in the industry in hard out in the uh, frequency of occurrence of hard alpha defect by the time of the Sioux City incident. And after the Sioux City incident, there was actually a very extensive industry-wide effort to improve handling, electrode welding, vacuum and water leaks in the coral and magnesium processes, and so on. And those are believed to give another 10 times reduction in the frequency of occurrence of hard alpha defects. And the um, assertion I've heard made in the industry is that it's something like a frequency of occurrence of one per 10 million pounds of melted material, one per five uh, million kilos or one per 5,000 tons. Uh, that's something like one in a thousand castings. Um, so it's believed to be very, very infrequent now. Um, what has been done uh, since then, uh, as well as uh, time out, as we said in, in the previous lecture, have introduced for in their Morgantown plant a skull melting process. Um, the SMPO actually have a similar process, uh, which they've had for a long time at their plant in, in Russia, which it, some manufacturers use, some don't. Um, and here, what time out do is they introduce, uh, they use a, a skull melting process where you could introduce material here, melt it under the electron beam, and anything, and then you have a very long residence time in the melt, and you can have superheat, which you can't really have in VAR melting. So you will melt those hard alpha defects, and any high density ones will drop out into the uh, titanium uh, frozen skull around the copper mole. Um, and then you'll only have good material which you pour into your ingot. Um, and the introduction of that meant that Timex can now do chip recycling, and therefore you don't have a separate stream whereby you have revert material that has low, no value. You now have high value, high quality recycled titanium. And that changes the economics of the business, but it also improves the safety quite significantly of the uh, melting processes. Um, but that said, people are still very happy with using coral material that then goes through a triple VAR if you have the quality in the coral process. That's the important part. So what's the implication, it's worth asking, for, for lifing? We've talked a couple of lectures about lifing. And GE uh, uh, have a, a thing you'll have heard of called Six Sigma, where they say for you know, making toaster ovens and stuff that you should only have one failure every Six Sigma, something like one in a million. That is, you should guarantee in your production process never to have uh, rejectable defects. So you don't spend a lot of money inspecting in quality. You make good product in the first place. And that mantra is you can't inspect in quality. We demonstrate here how it, we inspected this disk many times and we didn't find the, f the failure. So if you have a 9 in 10 chance of finding the defect with each inspection, 90% six times, that's very expensive, but also it still leaves you with more than a 1 in a million chance of having a failure. So you can't inspect in quality. You've got to make good material in the first place, particularly these large lumps where the hard alpha defect doesn't generate anything by the 3D method of inspection ultrasonics. So that logic contraindicates retirement for cause. The Air Accident Report actually talks about retirement for cause as being an interesting innovation that may help. But as we've discussed earlier, I don't think so in this particular instance. I, d I think that actually this accident contraindicates that. Um, the other thing is there's lots of excitement in the composites community about so-called damage-aware or self-healing materials. The idea for damage-aware materials is if you have a carbon fibre composite, well, why not put in some fibres there that you connect up to some electrodes, and if there is a crack that goes through and breaks them, you'll, you'll lose your electrical connection, and therefore you will notice that you have a crack. So your material will self-report that it has a flaw at the moment in which it has a flaw, and therefore you won't be reliant on human inspectors. Um, uh, an evolution of that idea is, well, what if I have some fibres in there that have some uh, epoxy in them that when you break the fibre, that will go in, react with the surrounding material, 
solidify and therefore self-heal the crack. And that's called a self-healing composite. And that would potentially mean that you could have a, a, a defect introduced by a, a bird strike or something, some cracking, um, and it would heal, and that would help you out. Um, and those, you can sort of see how for carbon fiber composites you might be able to do that, but for metals that are forged at a thousand degrees, nobody can understand how you might do such a thing. So they're not, those are nice sort of concepts, but they don't get us anywhere in the present era. And actually self-healing composites uh, and damage aware composites, nobody's flying as yet because nobody's figured out how to make, to live with the weight penalty associated with introducing these features. Um, so they're still, and we're still in titanium, saying we should make good material in the first place. So uh, one of the things here, titanium is not sensitive. It's fatigue resistance. It's very good fatigue strength for its density. Is a product of it not having any intrinsic defect because it will dissolve its own oxide. And because it doesn't have any oxide inclusions because it's never melted in an oxide. But that emphasizes that if you do have a defect, then you have a problem in titanium. So titanium production is only as robust as the quality of the manufacturing supply chain. So the air engine manufacturers, I mean, actually for all their materials, but particularly for titanium, very rigorously go around inspecting their suppliers and say to their suppliers that you must use exactly this fixed method of manufacture that we have certified by spin testing. And you will not de de uh, deviate from that fixed method of manufacture. And therefore, we will have the quality and the properties in the product that we certified with the airworthiness authorities. And that is absolutely key. You don't go out and buy titanium from some bloke off the back of a lorry. Uh, you buy it for, on a fixed method of manufacture that you have certified and verified gives you the performance that you uh, want. So in summary, these are taken from the accident report. Um, United Flight 232 was lost due to the failure of a TIE 64 stage one fan disc in flight that led to the loss of the hydraulic control systems and made a controlled landing impossible. And that disc uh, failed due to a hard alpha inclusion or defect present during manufacture um, at TIE MET or MI and then on at the Forder Alcoa. That defect wasn't found during manufacturing by GE or in service by United Airlines in their inspection processes. Um, GE's record tracking system was deficient um, and Douglas Aircraft Company failed to design a hydraulics system that was damage tolerant and the FAA uh, failed to notice that when they certified the aircraft um, and, uh, and all of those you will find in the conclusions of the accident report. So uh, more humanly, um, from a litigation perspective, there was blame to go around, and in fact, fractional responsibility was assigned in when it came to paying compensation. Um, and uh, humanly, would the one thing to emphasize is here is if you were running Alcoa's factory floor in 1971, then you had to go up in court in 1990. Now, you might have been 28 then. You'd have been 48 in 1991 you would have quite a lot at stake in your career then if you were senior in Alcoa. Whereas maybe you didn't when you were 28. So you can't take risks when you're 28 because they'll come back and bite you when you're older. So you have a responsibility, even when you're quite young, to do the right thing. Follow the fixed method of manufacture. Make sure your guys follow the fixed method of manufacture. And if something goes wrong, or you even suspect that something might be, to report it and scrap that disc and get another one, and accept that the loss of face and the loss of revenue and everything else associated with delays in the supply chain. Accept that. That happens. That's okay. But you must declare it. Very, very important. Um, the same is true for record keeping. Record keeping is absolutely critical. And it's one of those things. It's the dog that doesn't bark until something goes wrong. And the other thing, humanly, for a, a, an accident investigation, you end up doing failure investigation. Um, there's a thing in Rolls-Royce whereby actually they tend to want to cycle graduate recruits through failure investigation to give people the sense of responsibility for the bits that come that they're making, so that if you're in manufacture, you know what it looks like on the other end when you've got some broken hardware. And um, obviously, there are many, many failures that are non-critical that you catch uh, along the way that. Uh, 
sh hopefully give you the foresight to avoid the critical failure and the air accident. But when an air accident does occur, or an adverse incident of any kind, then that tends to become an all hands to the pump job in failure investigation. Nothing is more important to the company than going and finding out what happened and uh, establishing what the issues are for the rest of the fleet, if any, what the issues are for the manufacturing process, what happened, what to, say, what to report to the airworthiness or, or to authorities and how to resolve the issues. And it literally does become a, this is the most important thing going on. This is the most important thing and we must f understand what's gone on here. And it's an incredibly uh, interesting piece of uh, sort work to do. Um, and it rewards somebody who's patient and just plugs along and doesn't get excited or stressed about it. Just plugs along and t sees where the evidence takes you, sees what the material says. And doesn't try and overreach what it says, just says, this is what I see. Say what you see. And then uh, it's a very rewarding study, actually. It's very fascinating. Um, and feeds back into how we design and use alloys and how we manufacture them. So it's a really important function. Uh, so that's it for this segment. Uh, in the next one, we'll look at alloy design from the point of view of the human rotary rules and from a very fundamental perspective before we do the last four lectures where we formally look at titanium properly. I'll see you next time.